Okay. Good day, viewers. Um, I am Masana JCC, so I have come to con continue with our English language lessons for uh, senior secondary school. So today we are going to look at phrases and clauses. So this is a key component when you come to comprehension passages. Now already, uh, as you may know, uh, phrases and clauses usually is confusing to some learners. They find it different, difficult to differentiate the two. And then when you look at these two, they are not the same because there are things that you have to look for to see whether they are in or not. So if those things are not in, you know, it is a phrase if they are in their clauses. As we'll discuss later, you'll get to understand it better. So we are going to start looking at phrases today. Uh, if time permits, we'll also move on to clauses. Now, phrases are very many, uh, but we're going to limit it or narrow it to only three that may affect most of you are preparing for was, and that's going to be noun, adjectival, and adverbial. Though we have infinitive and as well as gerundial phrases, but then uh, we are going to categorize those ones either on a noun, adjective, or so, depending on the role of performance they do in context in which they are used. So well, let's look at phrase. It says, uh, uh, well, we start looking at definition first. A phrase is a collection or group of words which does not make a complete sense because it lacks a finite verb. So in short, that's something else. Phrase alone will not make sense because it lacks finite verb. And without finite verb, then it's going to be difficult for a phrase to express anything meaningful on its own, unless if you add something else to complete its meaning. So from there, before we uh, dilate on that more, we have to look at features of a phrase. Now these features is just like of a phrase. Now, features of a phrase. Now, f um, by looking at a particular group of words, you call it a phrase based on one grammatical evidence or the other. Now, one major difference, one major feature of a phrase is that it does not uh, express anything meaningful on its own. You get the point. So, for instance, if you say in the, in the house, this in the house alone is not expressing anything meaningful. Though you may add one thing or the other the, to, uh, to make it to express something meaningful. Now, this in the house, on the table, etc., are uh, phrases because, uh, yes, they are not conveying anything meaningful on their own. So that's one evidence. Two, um, it does not contain finite verb. So that's something very important. Now, finite verb. Now, we may not say phrases are a group of words without verbs. Sometimes people define it that way. But no, phrases are a group of words with or without a non-finite verb. So it means you may still have a group of words, like in the house, no verb at all. But you may still have a group of words with verbs, but then they are still phrases. Example, if we say the boy, the boy, for instance, the boy to be rewarded, the boy to be rewarded has gone. Now, assuming we have this, the boy to be rewarded has gone. To be rewarded is on the line. Hmm? Or even if you underline the entire thing, the boy to be rewarded has gone. When you look at here, we have two verbs here, be and rewarded. Be is acting as auxiliary verb, and the reward is acting as the main verb. But then we can change it to reward or rewards. We know if there was no to, the reward could change to reward or rewards. But then with this, it can change. So it's a non-finite verb. So we'll discuss that in detail. So also, um, all, uh, uh, they also uh, constitute group of words. Hmm? They constitute group of words. So phrases, group of words. You cannot use one word and you call that a phrase. It becomes a word. So anytime you have a phrase, it must be group of words. Could be two, three, or more words. But then what is clear is that they wouldn't make sense on their own. Uh, they are make, made up of group of words. And also, they do not contain finite verb. So these are some of the uh, features of a phrase. Now, let's look at this second point that phrases may not have verbs. If they do, 
the verbs will be non-finite. Now, let's look at it this way. Before we start looking at the examples or the different categories on the phrase, now let's look at which verbs are categorized as non-finite. So that if you are given a group of words and you happen to see those verbs, you will not call them close or name them close. So you know they are still phrases. Because if you are with the opinion that phrases are without verbs, while clauses are with verbs, if you are given phrases with these verbs that I'm coming to discuss, then it means you are likely going to get it wrong because you'll assume they are clauses when actually they aren't. Now, one thing is that phrases, verbs that are preceded by two, verbs, sorry, verbs preceded by two. So if you have to before a verb, that's the base form of a verb, that verb cannot change from one form to another. Now, we may have words like it. We know this it, it can take an inflection, its number. It can also take a, a past and morphem. D, uh, if it is a regular verb, like if you say uh, kill, it can take a morphem, like ed, and change it to past. This same thing can take s. So this it is irregular, therefore you cannot add the past and morphem d, so it be changes to it. You get the point. So now, this it can change to it, can change to it in this context. But the same it, if you have it here and there's two to it, this two has disabled this verb. So it cannot change from one form to another. It must always remain like this irrespective of changes on the subject or time. If you change the subject, the verb won't change. If you change the tense, the verb remains the same. That is the time. So therefore, it is non-finite. Let's look at it this way. Assuming we have an example like, um, for instance, if I say, the boy to eat the food, for instance, assuming we have this, the boy to eat the food. Now, when you look at this, we have subject here, boy, and we have verb eat. But now we have this two before this verb. If you change the subject, already the subject is singular. Now, if you change this to plural, we have the boys, you get the point, this two will come, and then this it will also come and it goes. Assuming there is another verb after. For instance, the boy to eat the food, has arrived. Assuming we continue like that, has arrived, for instance. Now, if this is the point, now this verb outside the online word, the boy to eat the food, this verb will keep changing to agree with the subject as well as the time. But then, this order, it will never change. It will always remain as, as it is. So that's why we call it non-finite verb. But it, assuming there was no to before, and it's only it, we know it can change to it, or it. So in that context, it becomes a finite verb. So you take note of that. Then from there, we move on to another category. Now, verbs, verbs in ing forms, verbs in progressive or continuous form. Now, that is why we call gerunds. You see, when verbs function as noun, then they don't take inflections. You get the point. So you may see it this way. If I say, for instance, uh, words like dancing, now this dancing, we have cooking, all these are uh, verbs in ing form, we have uh, eating, etc. So when you look at this, if you use them in context, then they become non finite because they cannot change their forms. Either you change the subject or you change the time. Let's look at an example. Assuming we have. Uh, the boy, the boy dancing, dancing in the room is Ali. Now, the boy dancing in the room is on a line. Assuming we on a line this, the boy dancing in the room is Ali. Here, the boy dancing in the room. Now, we are going to limit our analysis only on the underlying words. So anything outside it is not a problem here. Now, by looking at this, we know this is, is a verb, it can change. But for the fact that it is not on the line, 
So we are not going to use it because once we want to consider it, then we will call this a clause and get the answer wrong. So what we do is that our analysis should be limited to only the online words. And let's look at, look at it this way. The boy dancing in the room is Ali. Who is Ali? The boy dancing in the room. So this automatically becomes a noun phrase. Why? Because this dancing cannot change to dancings. So you cannot add S here. Nor can you inflect it with D, that's past and morphem D O E D. So it will ever remain like this. Now let's put pre proof it. Let's change the subject. Once we this subject is singular, we know it is the boy. If we change it to plural, we have the boys dancing in the room, then this is automatically changes to A. Now we say A, A Ali and maybe Buba. Now it means there is a verb that changes to agree with the plural subject. But that verb is outside the underlying words. So if also we maintain the subject singular and change the time from present to past, then we say, for instance, the boy dancing in the room is Ali. Now, if you want to change the action to past, we said the boy dancing in the room was Ali. So this is also will change to was to agree with the time. So therefore, when look at when verbs end with ing, they are non-finite verbs. So take note: if you have two verbs, one ends with ing and the other one is there as auxiliary verb, and you know if you change the subject that auxiliary verb will change to agree with the subject, then that is a clause. Let me give an example. If we say the boy who is dancing in the room is Aliu. Now, the boy who is dancing in the room is on a line. Here, when you look at here, yes, we have dancing here, unlike this other dancing. The, here we have no auxiliary verb, while here we have an auxiliary verb. So this is helping the main verb, dancing. In this context, once we change the subject to boys, now let's change the two. The boys dancing in the room, is Ali will change to A. But here are the boys who, then this is changes to A. So that means that there is a verb among the online words we can change from one form to another to agree with the subject or time that makes it a clause. So you take note. So if there's only one verb and it ends with ing, you call that um, a, a, a phrase. But if there's auxiliary verb, we can change to agree with the subject or time, you call it a clause. So you take that, take note of that. From there we move on to, we move on to um, another category of non-final verbs. Verbs in past participle form, or verbs functioning as adjectives. Now, verbs in, in PP form, past participle form, or verbs acting as adjectives. Now, you may have a particular verb, and that's why it is very important you take note. Now, in English, uh, you don't just look at a word, you just say, this is this now. You have to look at the role that word plays in that context. Like, for instance, the word book can be a noun, can be a verb, can be an adjective. Now, somebody would say, how come a book becomes a verb? How come a book becomes an adjective? So you take note. So if you are looking at a, a, a phrase, for instance, and then such things come, don't just jump and say a book is always noun because you've been taught that books are noun. If I say, for instance, um, if I say the book, sorry, the, the book, a house in the hotel annually. Now, assuming this is an example given, they book a house in the hotel annually. By looking at the word book in this context, it's not acting as a noun. That's the role it plays. Here it is a do, it is an action word here. So it is acting as a verb. Because this book can change if you change the subject, can change if you change the time. They, which is third person plural pronoun, if you change it to third person singular pronoun, to 
she or he, the book all, all, automatically will take an influx on S to agree with it. So it means it has changed its form. You see? So also, if you change the time that the action, we, this is habitual, as you see, they, they book a house in the hotel annually. means something that's habitual. It was done before, it's done today, it's likely going to happen later. But now, assuming you just want to do away this annually, they book a house in the hotel. Now you can change the timing that they booked. Now this book will take past and morphem ED to indicate past action. So that is telling you that uh, words, we need to be very careful. We, let's not just look at a given word because we are taught that this word is a noun and we feel it's always a noun irrespective of the role it plays in a given structure. So you take note of that. Now we have many examples. When you look at the class, you have your fan, the table, you see the chair, all belong to two different word classes. Chair can be a, a, a noun, the chair, of the chair, you get the point, it becomes nominal and it becomes a noun and now that's it. And you can say the man chairs the meeting or we will chair the meeting. In that context, the chair is play a role of a verb. The table is the same thing. Uh, we bought a table and then they will table a bill before parliament. So table in that context becomes a verb. So you take note of that. So it means what you do is very simple. Once you have underlined word, look at each word there and see whether there will be changes on a particular word if you change the subject or time. Once that happens, you know that is a clause. But once the word remains, the words remain the same, no matter changes on the subject or time, they don't change, then you know it is a phrase. So you take note of that. So now, verbs also will act as adjectives. As I said earlier, you will see a verb, like words like roast. Roast, we know it's a verb. But then, assuming I give you this example, if I say, they, they roasted some granules. Now, assuming I have this, and I say example two, I say example two, the roasted, the roasted groundnut, we are stolen. Now, assuming this, we have these two examples. By looking at here, they roasted some groundnuts. The roasted groundnuts, we are stolen. Looking at these two, the word roasted, here belong to two different word class. You get the point? So if you only know roasted as a verb, and in this context, if this is on a line, the roasted groundnuts, you are likely going to say it's a clause, and you get it wrong. How do we get this right? This is the last this is word before the roasted. Now just draw arrow to the first after the word roasted. Do the same thing here, and you point at here. Read them. They some groundnuts. They some groundnuts. The groundnuts we are stolen. The one that makes sense is telling you that it's an adjective. And the one that does not make sense is a verb. And this will tell us that roasted in this context is a verb, while in this other context is an adjective. So you take note of that. So it means words um, keep changing their word classes based on the role or function they play or do in the, uh, different sentence structures. So you take note of that. So you'll see now with this, if I say the roasted granite we are stolen. This can answer the question who or what. What we are stolen? The roasted granite. Automatically, it becomes a noun phrase and it becomes sub a subject of verbs. So that's the point that you need to take note. This other one is a verb. You get the point. So you, you take note. So always, if you have such words, roasted, grill, and many other things used in context, don't just roast a name. L analyze the role that particular word plays. You can always ignore the word and connect the rest. Once they make sense, then you know they are adjectives, functionally. But once it doesn't make sense, you know they are verbs. So it means they are integral part of it. And once you do without them, then you wouldn't express anything meaningful. Because when you just say there are some granules, it doesn't make sense. So you want to express something that people will actually understand. I hope you are taking note of what I'm trying to say. So from there, we move on. Now, it means now, by looking at these three categories, take note that phrases may be without verbs, but phrases, you may still have verbs in them. So, but then they have to be non-finite verbs. And we, we talked about the three 
that verbs in ing form, verbs um, that are preceded by to, and then verbs in past participle form, or verbs acting as adjectives. So with that, uh, you'll get to uh, understand this better, and you'll not find it difficult to identify uh, phrases from clauses. So today, as I said earlier, uh, we're going to, already we've given definition of phrase, and we've talked about features of phrase that uh, they are in groups, so a phrase cannot just be a word. Once it is a word, it becomes either noun, adjective, adverb, or so. But phrase must be a combination of two or more words that may, or, m that may contain or not contain a, a, a non-finite verb. And then also we said phrases do not express anything meaningful on their own or less and until they've uh, gotten something else that will complete their meaning. And then from there, we also talked about um, non-finite verbs. We said that's what you need to take note of so that you identify phrases from clauses. Because if we only say phrases are without verbs, then that may be true to a point, but then that could also mislead you into attempting questions in very unacceptable ways, and then that will also cost you marks. So in order to avoid that, that's why you have to consider all these things, that once you have a verb, don't just say that's a verb, it's a clause, no. Always determine the category of verb. Is it finite or non-finite? If it is non-finite, phrase. If it is finite, phrase. Now, also we said now, from there, from non-finite to finite. Now, we'll discuss that in detail when you come to clauses. And take note, any verb that changes to agree with this subject or time is finite, as simple as that. But if the verb fails to change, once subject is changed or the tense changes, then that is a non-finite verb, as simple as that. So assuming we have an example like this, if I say the boy, the boy, um, the boy runs fast. Assuming this is an example, the boy runs fast. Now this run, runs is indicating present action. You can change it to the boy ran fast. So this runs is finite. You get the point. And then if you change the subject to boys and you maintain the time, then this runs, the S inflation will drop and it becomes the boys run to indicate a present action. So that's what you need to take note of. So let's move on to the different types now. Already now, by looking at the board, we've uh, uh, defined it, looked at features, and then we've also looked at non-finite verbs. So we are moving on to types. Now, as I said earlier, we have different types of phrases. But for this lesson, we are only going to limit it to three. That's noun, adjectival, and adverbial. And I know that's going to be suitable to you as well because when you look at all past words questions, usually it's centered around the three. That's noun, adjectival, or adverbial. So that's why we also want to tailor this to suit you so that you wouldn't find it difficult to cope when you come to your exam questions. So we move on to noun phrase. Okay, so noun phrase. Now, who can give me definition of noun phrase? Can you define a noun phrase? Now, let's put it this way. Even before coming to this, already what classes we are exhausted. We've looked at all the types comprehensively. So whatever a noun as a word does, a noun phrase or noun clause do. Get the point? So it means a noun phrase, once you know role of a noun as a word, Once you know role of a noun phrase, you get the point, noun as a word, then you will also find it very easy to identify noun phrase from the rest. Let's just put it this way. Now, nouns have different roles. Adjectives, different roles. Adverbs, the same thing. So functionally, if you see two or more words playing the role of a noun, then you call that noun. If it is playing role of an adjective, call it adjectival. If, you, if it is playing role of an adverb, you call it adverbial. As simple as that. So now we are coming to start looking at noun phrase. So who will define noun phrase for me? Okay. So noun phrase, good. So noun phrase is a group of words. It is a group of words.
without a finite verb. Do we just stop there? Is that alone? No. So it is a group of words without a finite verb and has its head word as a noun. Mm? And, and has its head word as a noun. Now, that's very interesting. So you take note. Now, a noun phrase have indicators. We call them head words. Take note of that. Not always the case. Now, another easiest way to identify noun phrase or noun clause from the rest is that they have head words. And then, one is articles or determiners, like A, an, some, D. Or it can be a noun. You may have a noun. You can also have a pronoun as the head word of a noun phrase. And this will help. Take note. A and some can be noun, can be adverbial. So you take note of that. When we get to adverbial phrase, I will explain. Let me just give you a typical example. If you say a mango in the basket was stolen. A mango in the basket. Assuming we have here example, a mango, a mango in the bas basket was Stolen. For instance, you underline this a mango in the basket. By looking at this a, already we said it's an indicator of a noun phrase. Then you know this is noun. A mango in the basket, there's no verb here. You get the point. So you call it noun phrase because it can answer the question who or what. So therefore, this is noun. If you say, I, I missed Omar. For instance, a minute ago. Now, a minute ago, by looking at this, this is indicating time. And that's why it becomes adverbial phrase of time. And then it modifies the verb missed. While this other one, a mango in the basket, is a noun phrase, and then it is subject of the verb phrase was stolen. So you take note of that. So these are indicators, A and some D, a noun or pronoun, and in addition to that, noun phrases and clauses answer the question who or what, who or what. So it means if you have a noun phrase or clause, if you put the who or what before or after the verb and make a question, the underlying word will serve as answer. So you take note of that. Let's look at it this way. Now, a mango in the basket was stolen. If you put here what was stolen, the answer is going to be a mango in the basket. So this becomes a noun phrase, I become subject. I miss Omar a minute ago. If you put here, I miss Omar who? I miss Omar what? It wouldn't make sense. So that is telling you that this cannot be noun. As simple as that. I hope you are following. Good. Now we move on. So you take note. So it means, um, that's it. These are indicators or head words of noun phrase, phrases. For instance, A and some D, a noun or pronoun. And all noun phrases or clauses answers the question who or what. It means you put who or what before a noun. Let's look at some examples on the noun phrase. Example, we have the man is my uncle. Example one, the man is my uncle. Now, if you look at here, the man is on the line. Now, if you put here, who is my uncle? You get the point? Put here, who? We talked about who or what. Who is my uncle? You have a question mark. The answer automatically becomes the man. So this becomes a noun phrase. And it becomes subject of the verb is. Because this is a phrase, even though we have two words, as I mentioned earlier, phrases are two or more words. But if it is only one, you call it a noun. But since it is two, you cannot call this noun, but a noun phrase. Example two, we have, if you say dancing, Dancing in the room was bad. Assuming this is an example, dancing in the room, remember we talked about gerunds. Dancing in the room was bad. What was bad? Dancing in the room. So contextually, this is also a gerundial phrase, but it is playing role of a noun. So you just call it noun. 
no need to call it a gerundal phrase acting as a noun phrase no that's going to be very long uh, and unacceptable just look at a typical role that this plays and you call it as such since it is playing role of a noun give it that name finish now here also if you said dancing in the room was bad what was bad dancing in the room so this becomes a noun phrase and becomes subject of the verb was if for instance we have another example three we say to 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 eat in the kitchen is bad or oh, is okay is bad fine now the idea is now to kitchen to eat in the kitchen, assuming we have it this way. Already we talked about non-finite verbs, but by looking at these two, you know each of them is having a non-finite verb here. This is the geron, this is the verb preceded by two. It's an infinitive. So therefore, to eat in the kitchen is what is bad? To eat in the kitchen. So this becomes a noun phrase, and it is subject of the verb is. So it means, even though we have verb in this, this verb is already disabled by two. It cannot change to it, it cannot change to it. It must always remain as it is. So that qualifies it to be called a phrase. And by looking at the role it plays here, we play the role of a subject, then we call it a noun phrase. So need to say prepositional. Because take note, most phrases are prepositional. But then the role they play will determine the name you give to them. One particular phrase may be introduced by one preposition in one context it becomes adjective. In another context, it becomes a noun. So what you do here, uh, uh, you look at the role it plays, you call it as such. And ex another example, if I say, for the man, the man declares his wife a queen. Hmm? The man declares his wife a queen. Now this, a queen is on the line. You get the poem. The man declared his wife. We know very well in this context, as we'll come to look at the different functions of noun phrases. The man declares his wife. The direct object is wife. And this queen is complementing that direct object. So you see, so therefore, this is a noun phrase, you see, and it is complement, it is object complement. So it is complementing the direct object here. Though we are yet to look at type, type, but then just to make you understand better. So this is also a noun phrase. So then we also have the, the last one, the last one, example five, a tree, like example one, we have uh, the tree, sorry, we have the tree fell across the road. Get the point. Now, when, by looking at this, we have the tree fell across the road. Already you have the tree. If you put here what fell across the road, what? By putting here what? What fell across the road, the answer is going to be the tree. So it becomes a noun phrase, and it becomes subject of the verb fell. Get the point. So basically, that is for to generally to look at examples on the noun. So now, we are going to move on to different functions of noun phrases. You get the point. Noun phrases, just like nouns, have many functions. And now we are coming to look at the first function, that is the function as subject. Now we are moving on to noun phrases functioning as subjects of verb. Now the first function is subject of verb. Now we have ex a, a one, subject. Subject of verb. That's one. And this is very simple. In simple language, when a noun phrase is underlined before a verb, it is subject of that verb. Simple. When a noun phrase is underlined before a verb, it is subject of that verb. Let's look at some examples here. If I say example one, if I say one, the boys, the boys danced in the room. Now the boys danced in the room. Now here, if we underline the boys, 
What you look, look at is that, look at the underlying word. Look at its position in relation to verb. Simple. Now, if you have the underlying word, the boys, where is the location? Is it after the verb or is it before it? Now that it is before it, which word comes after it? Now this danced. Already we know this should be a verb because it has taken a past and morphem D. If you do away with this, it has changed the tense from past to present. Therefore, here, the boys, what you do first, for you to convince anybody that this is a phrase, you have to analyze the underlying words. Phrase or clause, doesn't, it doesn't matter how many words you have. But what we look up for is that, is there any finite verb? And now, let's look at this. D is an article and boys noun. And it's where everything stops. So now that there's no verb at all, you cannot call this a clause. You call it a phrase. And now by looking at this, we know you can, it can answer the question, what or who? Who dance in the room? If you put who here, who dance in the room, the answer is going to be the boys. You get the point? So this becomes a noun phrase, and it is subject of the verb danced. I hope you are flowing. Good. So we move on to another example. If I say example two, the tall girl, the tall girl in the room writes neatly. Now, assuming we have here, the tall girl in the room writes neatly. Assuming this is the point, who writes neatly? The answer is going to be the tall girl in the room. Now, even though this is very long compared to the first one, the first one has only two words. We said phrase. Somebody will say, no, 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 no. This is very long. The tall girl in the room, close. The idea is not whether it is short or long. The idea is, is there a verb? If yes, what category of verb? Can the verb change? Yes or no? And the yes or no will determine whether you call it a phrase or clause. By looking at this now, the tall girl in the room, do we have any verb in it? Good, no. No verb in it. So it is a phrase. And now this can answer the question who or what. Here, two indicators here. The head word here is article D. And second, if you put here who writes neatly, who writes neatly, the answer is going to be the tall girl in the room. So this becomes a noun phrase, and it is subject of the verb rights. You see? So let's look at that example. If we say, for example, two, if we say example three, to look through the window, is is not not allowed now to look through the window is not allowed if you align to look through the window you assuming this is on a line to look through the window now here the head word is a preposition but then by looking at the role it plays now let's look at it this way what is not allowed now you put here what is not allowed the answer is going to be to look through the window. Now we have a verb here. That's this look. We know it can change to looked. It can change to looks. But in this context, it is disabled. It is non-finite because it cannot change to looks, nor can it take past and morphem. So it will ever remain look. So since that is the case, you cannot call this a clause because there is a verb that you feel qualifies it to be called a clause. No. So this is still a phrase and it is a noun phrase. So I told you earlier, don't mind the head word. The head word could be preposition, but then what you do first is that look at the role it plays. Since it is play role of a subject, we call it a noun phrase. No need to call it prepositional phrase, first as noun. Just call it a noun phrase because it is play role of a noun. So this is a noun phrase. So that's it. So basically what we do here is that by looking at these examples, whether they are uh, uh, short or long, it's not important. What is important is that do we have a verb in them? If no, phrase. If yes, what type of verb are they? Are they non-finite or finite? In other words, can they change? If they can change, we know it's a clause. If they can't change, we know it's a phrase. So basically, that's that. So when you come to subject of verb, take note. That's one function of noun. It means when a noun phrase is on the line, is on the line before, 
the verb, it is subject of that verb. Let's move on to a second function of noun phrase. That is, noun phrases, after subject of verb, we have object of verb. Object of verb. Now, take note of that. So that's very important, you see, as an object of the verb. So we can just put the verb here now as an ob object of the verb. So it means now, this is a very simple thing. Take note. When a noun phrase is underlined after main verbs, because if anybody just say when a noun phrase is underlined after a verb, it is object. No, that may not be co correct. You must say when a noun phrase is underlined after main verb, because if it is a linking verb, that clause or phrase will be a complement. So you take note of that. So it means object of verb, that is when a noun phrase is underlined after a main verb, then it is object of that verb. Let's look at an example. If I have example one, we say the boy, the boy killed the goats. Now, the goats is underlined. Now, by looking at this example, the boy killed the goats. The goats here is underlined after main verb killed. So this is direct object. The boy killed what? Take note. We said you can use who or what, before or after the verb, and make a question. If the underlined words have as answer, you know it is now. The boy killed what? The answer is going to be the goats. So this is a noun phrase, and it is object of the verb killed. So you take note. Let's look at example two. If example two, as she bought, she bought a mango. Now, she bought a mango. A mango is on the line. She is the subject here. Bought is the main verb here. If you say she bought what? The answer is going to be a mango. So this also becomes a noun phrase and it is object of the verb bought. Then example two, Three, I say, the wind, the wind destroyed the roofs. Now, if the roofs is on a line, the wind destroyed what? The answer is going to be the roofs. So this becomes a noun phrase, and it becomes subject of the verb destroyed. So this is the second function of noun phrases. They are either subjects, or object, and these are things that you need to take note of. Now, we, from there, we move on to the third function of noun. That is going to be uh, the third one. So we've talk, talked about uh, subjects of verb and object of verb. Now we are moving on to the third function of noun. So take note, already, don't forget, we made mention of, uh, um, we made mention of um, noun phrase. The first function is subject of verb. The second is ob uh, object of verb, and the third one should be, um, should be subject complement. Should be subject complement. Now, now when you come to subject complement, just as I said earlier, this is going to be the third function that we are coming to look at, subject complement. When the noun phrase is the same thing like the subject, then it is complementing the subject. And the rule is very simple. Usually, when you have the subject, before the noun, if there's a linking verb, then you know that phrase is complementing the subject, as we'll come to see here now. Example one, if I say, Example one, if I say Lamin, Lamin is the teacher. Now, this is underlined. Now, you cannot call this object of the verb is, because this is not a main verb, but a linking verb. And who is Lamin? The teacher. Who is the teacher? Lamin. So the two are one and the same. You get the point. So it is complementing this. So you take note, that's why when you have a noun phrase after main verb, you call it object of verb, but once you have it after linking verbs, they become subject complement. So Lamin and the teacher are one and the same. This also is similar to appositive phrases. 
And then the difference between this and appositive phrases is when, for this one, linking verb connect the two. For appositives, no linking verb, but two commas. After the lamin, you may get lamin, the teacher. Lamin, comma, the teacher, comma, has arrived. So it becomes appositive in that context. But with linking verb connecting the two, then you call this subject complement. So this is an unphrased, and it is acting as subject complement.